We want to honor everybody's time because we are thankful that you are here and that you matter. And so we want to make sure that you get to lunch at an appropriate time. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here, um, I'm Kimberly Cook. I'm Travis's wife and other things. And um, I have been a member here for a long time. I actually came here when we were dating. And uh, just so excited, again, to be starting this new study. So we, did, we just came out of four weeks studying the Trinity, and some of you all I very much recognize faces. Uh, and then some of you are new faces, and you're here because you want to talk about eschatology. So that's the next four weeks. <laughs> We're going to tackle eschatology. Good heavens. Here we go. Um, <laughs> so a few announcements before we get started. Uh, we have a book giveaway, actually, from the previous four weeks. This was the, one of the books we largely used during Trinitarianism. And we want to encourage you to sign in because the church wants us to encourage that, and it tells them that there are people who are interested in theological um, conversation and teaching specifically here at the church, so it's important for your voice and your name to be present. Uh, to encourage that, we had a giveaway, and for that, is Doug Sheffield here? Doug, you get none like him, no one like him. <laughs> it does It does not. <laughs> Maybe a couple charts, that's about it. <laughs> All right, um, again, so please, if you didn't on the way in, uh, please sign in if you wouldn't do that for us. Does, uh, did everybody get a handout? It's just a one page front and back. Did everybody get one? Okay, awesome. If you didn't, there should be more right outside the door. And, okay, so just a quick preview of the series. So today we're going to be talking about Christ's return, uh, specifically the different interpretations. Oh, no, I don't want to try again. Um, the different interpretations that, that will guide actually all of the rest of our weeks. So there are, are at least four major interpretations of revelation, prophecies, apocalyptic literature, all of that that we see in scripture there's four very distinct ways of approaching that, and so we want to introduce you all to that today. But we're also going to talk about what all Christians should believe. <laughs> so a little, touching a little bit on orthodoxy in eschatology. Uh, we, there, eschatology, uh, which, by the way, is last things for anybody who's wondering what that really means. It's the study of last things. And there are lots of opinions and lots of strong opinions with regard to interpretations, but we will talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, and then, so, but yeah, and then that's today. So that's today. Next week will be the millennium. So we're going to talk about Christ's return today, the millennium. Then the third week will be final judgment and eternal punishment. That'll be fun. And then, <laughs> and then week, yeah. <laughs> And then week four, we'll be talking about the new heavens and the new earth. And that will, ironically, because it's going to be eternity, that actually won't take us as long. <laughs> so we'll also have a little bit of time for like a general Q&A that last session too. So that's a little bit of a roadmap of where we're headed both today and in the next four weeks. And uh, Travis has a little bit of an orientation, again, to the interpretations and how we're going to approach the whole thing before we really dive in. Love, do you want to do that and then pray? All right. Good morning. All right, let's see here. All right, so the approach to the class. This is important. There are four things that everybody, every Orthodox Christian should hold, okay? We're gonna talk about those four things. And then outside of that, it is wheels off. <laughs> so I want everybody to, to repeat after me. I believe, I believe. some things, some things. That, are wrong. that are wrong. Look to your neighbors. You believe, you believe. some things that are wrong and that is okay 
the great thing. So for instance, outside of these four things, the four core things, they don't, uh, you don't have to believe correctly necessarily to participate. For, so for instance, if you don't believe in like a rapture, so like a pre-tribulation rapture, the good news is you don't have to believe in it to participate. If you're wrong, you can high five people on the way to heaven and be like, woo, we're missing out on tribulation, yay! <laughs> I was wrong, yay! It's okay, it's okay. Because these are things that are held loosely and because they're, they're really just theories, let's be gracious to one another in how we interact. There are probably, there are certainly differing opinions here, and I know this because even within my own self, I have differing opinions. I wake up in the morning sometimes and I'm like, I believe this. And then I read something and I was like, well, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so let's all be gracious to one another, widely different interpretations. Uh, but we are going to, I guess, pray and then we will uh, dive in together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, it is good to always talk about your word. And your word, uh, sometimes, particularly in this case, can be very confusing for us. Um, part of it is our uh, just need, Lord God, and the way that you've made us to have answers. We seek knowledge and we seek understanding and we seek wisdom, and that's how you've made us as human beings. And so, God, I pray that you would today satisfy that journey for many of us in some way, shape, or form. I also pray that you would stoke that fire in us, Lord, to uh, endeavor to know more, and not just so we can, we can know more, um, Lord, but so that we can know you more and understand the God that we love and the God who loves us. So, God, guide our conversation today. Help us to be gracious with one another and uh, bless our time. And we love you, Lord, in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right, so you're back. Yeah. Um, okay, so the first thing, uh, we're like we've said a couple times, there's going to be uh, several different interpretations. Today we're walking through four of them. And I'm going to walk for you through the first two, and then Travis is going to take the second two. Uh, so the first interpretation, <sighs> all right, gear up, because this is a little bit like, it's not out there, because I don't want to be pejorative to the people who hold this, but it is conceptual. So, um, on your verse sheet, you should have, the first one that you should be looking at would be side one, um, varying interpretations, and then you should see Revelation 1, 1 to 3. So, um, this passage is going to be, not surprisingly, interpreted differently, and it is kind of one, like, ground zero of the different tracks that we're going to be talking about. So the idealist interpretation would look at Revelation 1-3 as a signal, especially Revelation 1-1, um, but this passage as a signal of apocalyptic literature. That's a very important phrase for them. So uh, <laughs> that's a, it, they look at it as a genre of literature that has very specific, um, okay, so, so let me backtrack. So when they see that in Revelation 1-1, they say, oh, then Revelation is apocalyptic literature. And we have these assumptions about apocalyptic literature that we are now going to apply to Revelation. It's not necessarily because it's based on their, interpre their interpretation of the whole book of Revelation. They interpret the book of Revelation and other prophecies like in Daniel and the Olivet Discourse in Matthew, they interpret all of that through these presuppositions of what apocalyptic literature means. So those presuppositions are that apocalyptic literature is characterized by symbols and Im imagery. That's key. For them, they look at it and they say, it's more like, it's like this apocalyptic literature isn't actually saying anything specific it's these broad brush strokes like a huge mural and you have all of these symbols and you have all of these images and really what you're supposed to do is take a step back and look at the whole thing and you get the mess you get the message or you get some like principles or truths from that large mural that's painted through through very like strong and colorful images and words. Um, it's, it's attempting to communicate timeless truths. And um, some people who hold this interpretation 
would understand, would not understand there to be an actual, like, final consummation of all things. They would say, it's just where we are now, and, um, and this is all a message of really, like, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a second, but good versus evil, and that good will eventually win. That's kind of the timeless truth of this, and so there's not really anything coming beyond a constant battle between good and evil, and we hope, and the and scripture is telling us that one day, good will eventually win out. Um, there are others who hold this interpretation. So that would actually be, we'll talk about later, outside of the realm of what, of orthodoxy, outside of the realm of what Christians should believe. But there are some who hold this interpretation within the realm of orthodoxy where they would say there will be a final consummation. Christ will return physically one day. But as far as revelation and the passages in the Bible that are talking about what uh, that are that are in the Bible, they're not really talking about that. They're not even talking about any historical event, any one historical event at any point. They're just giving us this overarching picture of what the battle of good and evil looks like, how we as the church should be, um, and as the world should be governing ourselves well, and an assurance of the final triumph of good or of God, depending on which kind of side of the aisle you would land on. Does that make sense to everybody? Not necessarily do you agree with it, but does that make sense? Okay, awesome. So again, and this is the other important thing. So for the keys for understanding this interpretation are the assumption, there are assumptions that come with apocalyptic literature to the Bible and all of the passages and like prophecies and book of Revelation that we see, and that there is no application to one specific historical reality. So there, it might be coming true, it maybe came true when in 70 AD when um, Jerusalem fell, you know, that's a, that's a huge, you know, sign of evil winning, and then, you know, there's reassurance for those who are, uh, overrun by sorrow and evil and that kind of thing. But, go ahead. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Actually, you know, that's fair, because I was, like, pretty much there, and I was pay wasn't paying attention. Thank you. Okay. Um, so there's an example, a running example all day that Travis and I will have. Uh, the passage at the very, at the bottom of your varying interpretations page is about the beast. I'm going to read it because we're just going to reference it so many times. I saw a beast, so it's Revelation 13. I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphem blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for, they had, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? Okay, so for the idealists, looking at this passage, they would look at it and say, So the beast rising out of the sea would be any kind of antichrist figure, that has arisen against good or against things of God. So that could be um, Nero persecuting the early Christians. That could be Hitler. That could be Stalin. That could be any kind of antichrist going against good, that kind of thing. So, so there's no specific thing it's ever referring to. All right? So the question is, who holds this? Does anybody have a guess who would hold to this? It's okay. We're all kind of new. We're all getting to know each other a little bit today. Oh, TJ does. TJ, do you got it? <laughs> all right. So um, it, it might not come as too big of a surprise. 
traditional modern theologians and those from the classical liberal theology track would largely be the ones who hold this. Um, and if you're not familiar too much with that approach to theology, I'm going to give just a little bit of orientation because hopefully it'll make this make a little bit more sense. Um, they, it, it arose after the Enlightenment and basically came to understand that the knowledge of God is grounded in personal spiritual experience or like your kind of, so if you have an exper if you have a spiritual experience, which most human beings do, they say, well, that's your God consciousness. And that's where our knowledge of God arises from. It doesn't arise from any kind of special revelation in the Bible or in like an actual divine person of Jesus or anything like that. It comes out of out of who we are and our personal experiences. So they see the Bible as a collection of people's stories about their own experiences. So the Bible is helpful and it's worthwhile to look at because it shows us other people's spiritual experiences in different historical contexts, but it's not anything that should guide how we act because it's not applicable because we have different spiritual experiences in our own historical context, and we can't really be told what to do in our context compared to theirs. So that's how they see the Bible. Jesus was an insightful prophet around like 33 AD. They would, they would agree that there is some person that history does point to. Um, but really the reason that history still remembers him is because he preached um, a, helpful, a helpful message for humanity. He presented an ethic of kind of like a brotherhood of humanity. We should all care for one another and put each other ahead of the other one. There's a brotherhood amongst humanity and there is a spiritual context. Again, there's a context for our spiritual experience. So there's some kind of divine being or a God that there's this like fatherhood of God. So that he, Jesus brought an ethic and a context for the spiritual experiences we have. So the kingdom for modern theologians is really kind of a realized piece. Like there's no more wars. You know, we all, I mean like a little Star Trek-ish, like utopian. <laughs> like we no longer need money. We no longer need any of those things because we've overcome them and peace has come. Uh, and um, yeah, so this kind of utopian idea. All right, so I say all of that to kind of put you in the mindset of how they see the Bible and how they see all of that too. When we approach this, so the idealist lessons in apocalyptic literature are really just trying to lead us to an ethical kingdom. They're just pointing to what an ethical kingdom would look like. And so when we look at that, those big, broad-ranging, sweeping, um, timeless truths and pictures of timeless truths, the truths are what we obey and live by so that that ethical, utopian kingdom can come. So that's one group who would have this approach. The other group would be uh, liberation theologians who actually did arise mostly, arose out of that modern theologian camp. And th so they have most of those main assumptions and um, postures toward the Bible and toward Jesus' teaching and all of that. But where they differ a bit is that they see Scripture as a record of God's spiritual and physical intervention on behalf of the marginalized and the oppressed. So Jesus is the ultimate liberator because he liberated us from death and he began the church which whose work is to carry out liberation on all who are oppressed in the earth. So for them, the kingdom, and so those sweeping principles that we see as we look at revelation and prophecies, for them, they would be leading you to an ethical kingdom that has realized peace, just like the modern theologians, but also kind of an, over, an overthrow of the oppressors would be their kind of special nuance on that. And then I'm getting odd looks from people, and particularly Travis is going like this. So, 
I'm not debating. We're not, I'm not laying down that theology for debate because I know that that's linked to a lot of feels right now in our society. I am just introducing where that theology is coming from, how they see all of that, and how and how this interpretation, that they would take this interpretation when they're looking at eschatology. Does anybody have questions about how it relates to revelation, not liberation theology? I don't really want to go into that. Does that make sense how they see this, though? Um, well, actually, thank you. Oh, here's five bucks, because that's my next point. Evangelicals can actually also hold this view. Um, we would just hold, not. I'm not saying the liberation theology or the modern theology. I, I'm talking about an idealist interpretation. So there could be evangelicals who would say, no, the Bible, uh, when its accounts of, you know, prophecies and apocalyptic kind of images is really just painting these broad truths about the fight against good and evil and how God one day will make it all right and, and Jesus Christ will return physically and we will all, and you know and then you're in Revelation 20 21 and you're off on the same path that people who would take other interpretations are so they actually could include evangelicals it doesn't you wouldn't have to have this really conceptual approach to theology and you know, all these different approaches to Jesus and the Bible and all of that. But when I'm referring to they, I mean, I was referring to either the modern theologians or the liberation theologians. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So, um, okay. Real quick, the weaknesses of this approach would be that <laughs> Revelation 1.1 1, 1, does seem, now they're not literally interpreting it, but Revelation 1.1 1, 1 does kind of seem, and you have the verse right in front of you, to point to some kind of future event. And if you look down, there's also Revelation 1.19, I believe it's right under it, that talks about the things that were, the things that are, and the things that will be. So it, anybody looking at scripture, and all of these people take scripture seriously, would say, yeah, but those words seem to say that there's something actually going to historically happen. And, um, and if you don't allow any kind of significance, if you don't allow any kind of historical significance, then it kind of all begins to mean nothing, right? Because it's just so relative that it could, it could mean anything, which means it really means nothing which means that this is really unhelpful. So that's one of the main critiques against this interpretation. And another uh, critique is against, um, sorry, I lost my spot. Oh, the other critique is this, this stack of assumptions that they have about apocalyptic literature in general, like as an ancient literature genre other scholars who also work in ancient literature genres say that's not actually a completely accurate picture of what that genre is. Sorry. Apocalyptic literature, just side note as to what it is. Sorry. We're operating under the assumption that you'll know it when you see it in scripture. Like, you know, the parts of Daniel that talk about like lions that are fast and birds flying and it's like, and it's, it seems like the prophet has taken LSD and is now telling you about what they've seen. That's apocalyptic literature. So it's a little bit in Daniel, very much Ezekiel. There's like fiery wheels and stuff like that. And then all of Revelation being kind of trippy as well. That's kind of the genre of apocalyptic literature. We've kind of operated under the assumption that you would just know what that is. Well, that's what I've been referring to with the prophecies and the book of Revelation. But yes, thank you. You're welcome. LSD could be a helpful... <laughs> Not that I have ever done <laughs> any kind of drug, but I've been told. <laughs> All right. So, um, so again, back to that little stack of assumptions about that set of literature. Other scholars who work in that very same area look at that and they say, yeah, but a apocalyptic literature is actually still referring to some kind of historical event. 
that's part of what it means to be apocalyptic. And so this set of assumptions you're taking to this is actually not accurate. So the strengths, but the strengths of this approach would be it takes an allegorical, so it, you know, again, broad brush strokes, it looks at it, it's not reading it literally, so it's all kind of an allegory about some timeless truths. The, allegor the allegorical hermeneutic is, actually has a very long history in the church. It started with the Alexandrian School of Theology in about 100 AD, or AD 100. So it, it is old, and it has a very storied, respected history in the church. So that's the strength that it would have. Um, and it argues <laughs> that it has a very strong uh, hermeneutical, it has a very strong interpretational, like within the Bible approach, if you um, accept its assumptions, if you accept this set of apocalyptic assumptions and that it's not applicable to anything, any one thing in history, then the Bible makes perfect sense <laughs> when you read it that way, which is just funny because everybody... Yeah, anyway, um, everybody's interpretation makes sense if you accept their assumptions. Uh, so that is idealist. Any questions on idealist? Okay. No? Somebody's laughing. Okay. Um, futurist, I'm actually going to go a little quicker through just because we're more uh, familiar with this one being from a Baptist background and because of cultural events that happened, at least when I was growing up. Left um, Behind. Lo known as the Left Behind series. <laughs> so, the, um, so for the futurist interpretation, Revelation 1, is, you know how I said that that's where it all starts. They see Revelation 1 as communicating that all of this is predicting events that have not happened in human experience. So they see it as predict all predicting something that's going to happen and nobody has experienced really much, if any, part of it. Um, apart from Jesus' death and resurrection being kind of the first step to the, re the end times coming. So that's the already, already and not yet comes from this group. So that's the already of the kingdom is Jesus came and he triumphed over death and then not yet, there's all of these things that the Bible refers to that are coming in the future. Uh, Revelation 119, which again is here, is very large for this group. They hold, that is what they see as the roadmap of what Revelation, the book, and other prophecies and that kind of literature. There are things that are, there, or, I'm sorry, there are things that were, there are things that are, and there are things to come. And those are very distinct groups, and we don't, and we're on the edge of looking for things to come. Um, and I just included the Second Thessalonians 2 passage as kind of evidence of the New Testament church's, like, view uh, that there were things to come. Those who hold, okay, so the example for the beast coming out of the sea for the futurist interpretation would be that, th that there will literally be a beast. I, I, give me a second. Give me a second. I have an or coming. <laughs> there are some people who really think it will. <laughs> so that there will literally be a beast and these things will really happen between a beast and a dragon and that kind of thing. Those people are few and far between, which is why Travis was looking at me like this. Um... Or, <laughs> um, or they see the beast as a metaphor for something that will literally happen. Once again, we're talking about that there will be a specific point in history where it might not actually be a beast, but we would look at it at that point and say, oh, yeah, that makes so much sense. This is the beast. You know, that was a metaphor, but we, we see it now, and it's really happening. So that's how they would see and interpret that passage. Those who hold this, like I said, are largely premillennialists, dispensationalists, the left behind crowd. Uh, there are, and then a, a lot of the other interpretations could also be a little bit futurist if they actually see there being a final consummation that is still to come. So they would have futurist leanings in that way. 
And then the other group, <laughs> I'm sorry to go back to modern theology, uh, the, <laughs> the other group would be modern theologians who um, see Jesus as a prophet, just like I said, as a, like an insightful prophet, uh, and they read <laughs> these passages as, peop- as people and Jesus and the, the people writing the scriptures who truly but delusionally believe that things will happen in the future. So when they read it, they say, oh, yeah, this is futurist. Like, it's talking, these people are saying they think something's going to happen in the future. They're wrong, and they're crazy. But, yeah, they really do believe that it'll happen in the future. So there are some modern scholars who would approach it that way, and technically they would have a futurist interpretation too. I tell you that because if you end up, like, in a thrift store or something, and you pick up an eschatology book, and you're reading it, and it seems like it's kind of futurist, but it also doesn't seem right, it's probably from that perspective. <laughs> All right, any questions? Oh, oh, sorry. Um, any questions on understanding that? I'm going to talk about the strengths and weaknesses, and then Travis will be up with the other two. Okay, the weaknesses of this interpretation are, and this is a big one, this position leaves the book of Revelation specifically without any significance for the people to whom it is addressed. So the churches, that whole, like everybody that it's addressed to in Revelation 1 and 2 and 3, um, then why did, why was it written? What were they saying to those people? If it's all for the future, what, what did it mean then? It loses all meaning in that context. And it seems like because of verses like Revelation 5, in, I'm sorry, in Revelation 5, 5, it says, um, weep no more. Revelations 21, Revelation 21 says, wipe away every tear from every eye. It seems like there's a context of trying to comfort the people that it's written to. And it, it couldn't be if it's all in the future. So that's a, that's a big problem for this perspective that shouldn't be under underappreciated. It's a big problem. Um, the other problem Another big problem is that all of the terms that are used throughout Revelation, like soon and at hand and near and quickly, so they're ironically um, interpreted figuratively rather than literally. And this position really prides itself on a literal interpretation of all of it. But when it comes to some of the soon and quickly where it would seem more relevant to those who it was was originally addressed to— they interpret that figuratively, and, it, and so it seems um, inconsistent, and they get dinged on that quite a bit, too. The strengths, though, once again, if you accept <laughs> their all the assumptions, it's a very strong biblical, biblical approach, and, um, and in defense, in, in these guys' defense, just like the allegorical his, history of interpretation is very strong, so is the literal. They were two di- distinct Um, schools of theology all the way back to the very beginning of the church. And so the literal interpretation is just as strong. All right. That is the idealist and the futurist. Any questions? Anna? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the only already or the main already dimension is just Jesus's death and resurrection as the beginning of the end times. But the, anything happening after chapter three, um, they really don't they don't hold to. Like they would say it's all in the future. And so and so then like what? So why are there twenty one pa- like what you know what? Uh, that's math. Why are there 18 <laughs> chapter, more chapters of this book to these people that were it was addressed to if it's not for them? That doesn't make any sense. That's the argument against this interpretation. Does that make more sense? Okay. All right. Yep. All right. Uh, so I have two, um, obviously. Uh, the historicist view 
and the preterist view. Okay, so the historicist view holds that all of the, the events that happen in the book of Revelation can actually be traced to an event in history that is happening or that has already happened. Okay, so stop me if you've heard this one, but uh, whenever, whenever a certain country acts up, whether, and it's always a country that we don't like, right? So it's never like, you know, the United States is one of the, the evil empires. It's always like, well, Russia's doing something and China's doing something and these are the people from this place and the east and the west and then you've got these people coming from the north. That's a very historicist interpretation. They're taking the events that took place, they're taking the things that have happened or they're reading the newspaper and they're reading the newspaper alongside of the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, and they're making interpretations based on that. Uh, they tend to identify certain people, events, groups with people, events, and groups within Revelation. Uh, one of the most famous people to actually hold this view and actually probably make it the most popular uh, um, amongst, or one of the most popular people to hold it would be Martin Luther. Uh, his favorite target uh, for the historic, historicist position, anybody know who he liked to go after? Who was the Antichrist for Martin Luther? The Pope, yes. Uh, and the Papists, those godless Catholics uh, for Martin Luther, that's what he said. Um, people who hold this view tend to believe that the vast majority of the events that are predicted by Revelation have already happened and that they are living in the latter stages. So you're never going to meet somebody who's like, yeah, like they have already happened or they, the, 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 we've got the majority of the book to go. No, they're, they're smack dab in the middle of it. Does that make sense? Uh, it, it's a very uh, popular opinion. I think sometimes we confuse, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Kim, uh, we confuse having a futurist position with actually having a historicist position. Uh, so a lot of people say, I'm a futurist. I believe that all this stuff is going to happen. And in the same breath, they will tell you that Putin's the Antichrist. And you're like, that's not a futurist position. You're actually being a historicist. So the strengths of the view is it's incredibly helpful to the purpose of the book of Revelation. It encouraged the persecuted church. If you have that view, if that's the way that it's being written, the seven churches in the book of Revelation that the, the book is written to, it's very comforting. It can do the same thing. Uh, it reminds the believer that the return of Christ is coming soon, right? So if you're in, we're living in the last stages of the book of Revelation, if Jesus is right around the corner, well, I'm going to behave a little bit better. I'm going to be a little bit more evangelical. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not wait to tell my friend about Jesus because we're on chapter 19 and there's only 21 chapters. It's also incredibly interesting and it encourages the truthful idea that God is at work, he is working, and he's in sovereign control of everything. So you're able to read your newspaper or your news feed or whatever it is you kids do these days with a little bit more hope, a little bit more optimism, and looking at things that way. What are the weaknesses? Man, it's far too specific. That's one of the big critiques. So you never hear somebody talk about the Antichrist being a tribal leader in like lower Indonesia. It's always some Western European white guy who's the Antichrist, always. And it's because Western Christianity has gravitated towards this. A lot of what we consider the major world events to be are usually Western Christianity, right? So it's very specific. It doesn't take into account a global understanding of, of um, Christianity. Uh, there's zero consensus among people that hold this view. That's another weakness. So you're not going to find, like you're going to have some people that are like, Hitler, Antichrist. And they'd be like, no, 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 no. Stalin was the Antichrist. Then you got somebody from like 200 years ago being like, no, don't forget about Napoleon, Antichrist. There's just really hard to have any kinds of consensus. And then lastly, it would um, not have been helpful um, at all, sorry, uh, to the original readers. So my, my apologies, not the, I said the original readers before. It's incredibly helpful for the purpose of the book. So it's supposed to be encouraging to us. But the original readers of the book of Revelation, um, you're not really going to worry about too much uh, of who the Antichrist is if you're being persecuted. So that's the historicist view. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. Right, yeah, totally. Yeah, no, we don't ever, um, so like 
the Catholic Church, the Pope does not consider himself to be the Antichrist. Correct. Yeah. It's always an others kind of oriented. So the question is like, do people that read that ever see themselves in the book of Revelation? No, they are always the the church, right? The so guys. you're 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 the good guys. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so a couple things we'll do with that. One, we're actually going to have an entire week on the millennium. Woo! Next week. Uh, next week is the millennium week. Uh, so have fun with that. So we'll probably address it more to that extent. But my guess is, and, and cards on the table, I'm not a historicist, uh, they, would, uh, they would put it, uh, there would be like a, a, a lull between like an antichrist figure. And like there's not specific dates, so you can still have generalities, I guess. All right, let's get to the preterist one. This one's fun. Uh, I, I tell people that, that um, I think this is a really attractive view. I don't hold to it, but there's a lot of things that work for it. Uh, the preterist view holds that events described in Revelation have already taken place in history. Okay, so the book was predictive when it was written, probably, but the events largely have been consummated. They're done. Uh, so there's two brands of preterism. There's a Pepsi and a Coke version. Full preterism, which is the Pepsi version because it's really wrong. Um, full preterism <laughs> says everything has already happened. Everything. Christ has returned, is ruling through the church. So Christ's return came through like a spiritual sort of return. The, 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 the body of Christ. The body of Christ is ruling in, on, on uh, Christ's behalf. Christ's return, uh, we're already living in a new heaven and new earth, which hints my disappointment with this the same way I'm disappointed when someone says, is Pepsi okay? <laughs> Partial preterism is everything except for Revelation 20 to 22 has already happened. So 20 to 22 is your millennium reign, your, your new heaven, new earth, your literal return of Christ. Uh, and so obviously full preterism, and we'll get to this in a second, is kind of outside the bounds of real orthodoxy. Within the preterism views, there's also questions as to where uh, the preterism, like where the, the, the story stops and who is the subject of some of the, who's the bad guy in the story. So for some people, they think that the story stops in AD 70. What happened in AD 70? Fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, right? So the bad guys, the beast in this is, are, is Israel, it's the, it's the Jews. And so it's a very strong anti-Jewish position uh, from the early church that were having struggles with them at that point uh, because there was a big split within Christianity was seen as a subset of Judaism for a long time in the early church. And then they were kind of kicked out by the Jews. And so there was this uh, animosity between the two groups. So that makes sense. Um, the other view is that Rome is actually the, the beast. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, and Rome is the, the, the beast, uh, the, the Antichrist, the bad guy, uh, because of, of, of sort of the, the labels that are given to it. And that ended in the 5th century, okay? Uh, so those are the two different views. Now, uh, the strengths of preterism is it's incredibly helpful for those who are suffering at the time, right? All this stuff happening soon, happening soon, happening soon. Guess what? It is happening, so it's happening right now. Like it was, it would have been a historicist position for them, whereas it's a preterist position for us. Uh, God's in control of the events taking place. Uh, the weaknesses, uh, again, it's disjointed. Is it Rome? Is it Israel? I feel like if we're looking back on it, we should be able to tell, right? Uh, hindsight's twenty twenty. Apparently, unless you're a preterist, and then it's not. Um, really unhelpful if it's Israel. A and the book was written after 70 AD. So a lot of people think that the book of Revelation was written by John in 90 AD. So it's not actually predicting anything then. It's looking back 20 years ago and it's a, it's a bad news report. It's not very clear about what happened, right? So, and then again, it's, it's, it's got some heretical elements to it if you don't hold to a, a full preterism view. So let's look at the, uh, real quick before we, we end 
uh, and move into our next thing. Let's look at the passage, the, the Revelation 19 passage for each of those. So the, for, for the historicist, they would look at that, they would take that section and they would go through and they would be like, okay, this is what this is. What this is okay? So they would say, okay, the beast is, say, Hitler, okay? And the Ten Hills would maybe represent, and again, I'm, I'm just shooting from the hip here, the Ten Hills would represent something specific, maybe 10 years or 10 cities that he derives his power from, let's say Berlin and Stuttgart and Frank uh, Munich or whatever. And then the wound that he receives, well, he was almost assassinated, right? Uh, by, by, you saw the movie with Tom Cruise, uh, they tried to blow him up, and the, the, basically a table saved his life. Lame. Um, it's true, but the table was lame. Um, the, he, he received a wound, seemed mortal, but it wasn't, all that stuff. So that's how the historicist would read that position. They'd basically go through, and they would identify their person, who their antichrist is, and then they would, I don't want to say make it fit, because that's not appropriate, but, but essentially that's what you're, you're doing. You would try and read and put the puzzle pieces together that way. Does that make sense? And you just kind of do that throughout the book of Revelation. Uh, or Daniel or whatever prophecy you're reading. The other view, preterism, takes basically your, your ancient history textbook, lines it up next to the book of Revelation and say, all right, let's find a match. So for, for this passage in Revelation with, with the, the, the beast that receives a wound, their favorite target is Nero because there was actually a legend surrounding Nero that when he died, that he died and w like fled the country. Everybody thought he died, but he actually just received a mortal wound. It didn't kill him. He fled the empire, went into Persia, and he's gonna come back one day. This was actually a belief held amongst Romans and they were terrified that Nero was gonna actually come back and take over. So a lot of preterists would say, this is who this is referring to. John's keying into this in imperial fear that crazy Nero was gonna come back one day. And it, it makes a lot of sense, the 10 hills, Rome was founded on 10 hills. Like you can kind of go through and read your 10 horns or 10 crowns or whatever it said, uh, all that. Make sense? So that's how preterism would view. Any questions about historicism or preterism? They're very similar. They're like sisters, maybe like stepsisters. Oh, no, I didn't see you, sorry, blind spot. Um, I would think that would put you in the idealist camp. Probably would be my guest. Would be my guess, not guest. I don't know. Right? I mean, yeah, maybe. You're, well, you're, you're essentially saying that. No, because you would be potentially. It would depend. It would just depend. But I, if if there is a combination of any of these, there is somebody who holds it. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're, we're in the weeds here. Welcome, everyone. That's a good question. Because in, in fairness, there are attractive things about each of the views. Like, truly. And, and, you know, all joking aside, like, I'm a history guy. I like the preterist view. It makes sense. I'm, I, I'm not a preterist. But it makes sense. Just one other thing. Well, I was just going to say, in in with with what you're saying about some of them being attractive. Once again, these are all interpretations of people who take scripture very seriously. Mm -hmm. So it's not like people who just don't care about any of it. They they take it very seriously. They just interpret it in different ways. Yeah. Yes, sir. Man, okay, um, yeah, yeah, it has. Uh, it, it changes. It has changed a lot. Yes, he does, because uh, the Bible tells me so. Um, yeah, so I would say, uh, full 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 disclosure, uh, I went into DTS uh, Dallas Theological Seminary like full on pre trib pre mill. Let's go, you know, and uh, am less so probably now. 
uh, than I than I was then, which I would say is is a credit to DTS. If you know anything about Dallas Theological Seminary, that's their jam. Like that's how they've they've made a name for themselves being pre mill pre trib. Uh, so to walk out less that way, um, and I don't mind sharing where I'm at, but uh, not holding that position essentially, they really taught me to think for myself and to read for myself, and there wasn't like an indoctrination uh, in that regard. Um, so yeah, I've changed quite a bit. Uh, from being probably fully like pre trib pre mill, all future, uh, to 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 moving more towards uh, an amillennial, uh, even probably idealist position, um, you know. So uh, again, I'm one of those rare evangelicals that holds more to an idealist position because you see it. You see like the the. I mean, there's a reason why we can go through Napoleon and Hitler and Stalin and all that stuff and be like, oh, that's the Antichrist and that's the Antichrist and that's the Antichrist because they act like it. But at the same time, I think there will be, I think there's a big bad. I think there's a big bad coming and, and uh, I think he will make, uh, or she will make uh, our previous definitions of Antichrist look like minor leaguers uh, in comparison. So is that helpful at all? I hesitate, the only thing that hesitates me about saying my view is because I don't want anybody walking out here being like, well, this is what Travis believes, so I should hold it too. It isn't. Like, I am guessing just as much as the rest of us. Um, so. If it matters, I know I'm not the teaching pastor here, so it probably matters less. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I actually hold to a pre-trib, pre-mill. Yes. Like, so he and I disagree. Yes. On, and like, we still love each other. Yes. Like <laughs> and we're in counseling for it. So, so if there is a rapture, she gets to say, I told you so while we go to heaven. For eternity. For eternity. <laughs> and if there's not, I get to say, I told you so, and the Lord will wipe away every tear. <laughs> so, okay, let's move into ortho. <laughs> yes. Uh, now I'm trying to put where my kids would be. All right, let's, let's go quickly. Uh, you've got seven minutes to cover actual orthodoxy. So these are the things. There are four things that every Christian needs to believe. And then outside of that, it's like free lunch. Go for it. Be crazy. Have fun. Um, so here are the four things. One, Jesus is coming back physically. There is a physical return of Jesus. The angels say it at the end of the God, or the beginning, I think, of Acts and the beginning of, at the end of Luke. The, the Jesus that you saw leave is going to come back the same way. John 14, 1 to 3. He says, I'm coming back physically. Okay, so we're waiting on this to happen. It'll be physical, it'll be visible, it'll be unmistakable. It won't be under the radar as it was at Bethlehem. Nobody will miss it, nobody will stop it, and scripture talks about it in numerous places. Uh, also, we don't know when it will happen, and this is one of my big pet peeves, is when we try to figure out, well, the, you know, the numbers thing, or we try to add and subtract and figure out from the Bible. The Bible has X number of verses in it, so if you subtract three from this and that, you get when Jesus, is, we don't know. We don't know, and, and it is not helpful to try and figure it out. Because if you're wrong, which you will be, probably, like, you're hurting people's faith. Uh, it will be glorious, it'll be victorious, uh, and there will be no delay, so it's going to be sudden. It's not like we're going to sit here for, like, ten days and watch Jesus arrive. It'll be very quickly uh, happening. Any questions on Jesus coming back physically? Pretty much a slam dunk. So. Okay, cool. Uh, the dead will be raised. This is the 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52 passage. Uh, it will be a physical resurrection. So this is one of the things that we've let kind of creep into our churches, not just here, but I, I think other churches. There's this idea that when you die, you go to heaven, and you're just like a spirit playing a harp. That is not what's called the eternal state. That's not the condition in which you will exist for eternity. You will be a enfleshed, granted it'll be glorified if you're a believer, you will be enfleshed in your entire eternal existence. You will be a spirit and a body together. We were created that way, we will continue that way. Now death is a separation of those two things, and that's why death is painful. The soul and the body are separated. But Christ will raise the dead when he returns, that God will raise the dead when, when Christ returns, reuniting souls with with bodies. Um, some people uh, are mentioned in scripture uh, only believing in a spiritual resurrection and the apostles work really hard to shut that down. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 is all about. Uh, it'll not be a new body. 
but a renewed body, okay? And that's, that's important. Like, we're not all going to get to heaven and be Brad Pitt or pick you another person that you think is attractive. You will look like you probably, just like you 2.0, like glorified you, right? Um, which is good. The body you have, you'll receive back. Now, that's also important to talk about. I don't know how it works with like age and injuries and things like that. Like, I don't think my knees will pop every time I stand up in the eternal kingdom. I don't think that, like, I don't know. I don't know that we'll have mosquito bites and stuff. We'll, we'll figure that out. Um, you'll be made whole. You'll be restored. You'll be glorified. So I do think the blind will see, the lame will walk, that sort of thing. Um, it will be everybody, uh, the righteous and the wicked. This is another part of it, too. Both those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ will be raised and reunited with their bodies. Everybody gets resurrected. Not everybody gets glorified. There's a difference. Those who are raised and are in Christ are glorified to eternity in a new heaven and a new earth with Christ and God, the Father. The, those who are not in Christ are raised, judged, and spend an eternity in separation from God. Okay? Good stuff. You're up. You have All right, the last two. two. You just stay up here. Awesome. Um. The last two are, I'm, I'm going to go through them really quick because they are our last two weeks of this four-week series, so we will jump largely into these areas. Uh, the last two things that Christian, all Christians believe would be that there will be a final judgment. Uh, do you have the outline? Um, that there will be a final judgment uh, in, yeah, the... The Nicene Creed, which we talked about a lot during the Trinitarianism uh, session, we kind of look to as our measure of orthodoxy. And this is the section of the Nicene Creed that talks about the end times and the last things. It says, he will come again with glory, so second return of Christ, uh, to judge the living and the dead. So there's the resurrection and the final judgment. And, um, and this uh, final judgment is an accountability for how we lived our, the lives that God granted us. Unbelievers will be cast into the lake of fire along with Satan and his angels. Believers will be held accountable and rewarded for what they did with the life that God gave them, but they will not be condemned because Christ's sacrifice keeps that from happening. And um, the key here, though, at this point is just to remember, and we will emphasize this when we teach it next time, too, is that this is not about us. That's the, this, um, though, it is, though it is humanity being judged, it is not about humanity. This is not about your sins or your failures or your successes being on some giant big screen. Uh, this is about God. This is about God demonstrating his glory this is about God demonstrating his holiness, and this is about God demonstrating his grace and his mercy. So this is not about humanity, even though human, it is, humanity is central to the judgment. It is about God demonstrating who he is and the final consummation of this, this story. Uh, and then finally, uh, there, the final thing that all Christians need to believe is that God will dwell with humankind forever. So that would be that his kingdom will never end, part of the Nicene Creed. Uh, Revelation 21 makes it very clear that God intends to dwell with humanity and in a new heaven and a new earth. And so, like I said, we'll unpack each one of those two much more in it's time to come. Uh, to land the plane? No, yeah, why don't you land the plane? Okay. <laughs> um, so the four things are... Coming physically, yes. The dead are raised. Final judgment. God will dwell with us. Congratulations, you're all orthodox. Yay. Well, I guess nobody's going to be burned at the stake today. Uh, okay, so if you have any other questions, by all means, Kim and I will hang out up here. Um, and then next week is the millennium. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about the millennium. And if we're all lucky, Christ will return before then and... We'll we won't have to do that. <laughs> All right. Have a great week. Bye. Bye, guys.